uh, upstate New York, and it's church at 12 when I got there, including the children. There was a beautiful piano and a beautiful organ, but nobody that would play either of them. So I taught myself to play the guitar, did a bang up job, by the way. <laughs> had an older man who had a ukulele, and he tried to lead that way. So th this is wonderful to me. Not only that we can make mistakes to remind us that we're all human, but that we have gifted people who can roll with the punches. <laughs> and and I, I have, I'm always fascinated by musically inclined people because I'm not. I'm not. Uh, but I certainly appreciate the many people. You know the irony about that first church? I was there six years. It, it grew. But we never did have anyone to play the piano. One day after church, I heard the piano playing for the first time. And it was a mom and her daughter. She was a deacon's wife, by the way. And, she, and the daughter was a teenager. And I'd been there for four years. I said, I didn't know you could play the piano. Yeah. And what, what was I thinking? Why have we been struggling through Gene's ukulele and my lousy guitar? You know, it's one thing to have an ability. It's another to be able to step up and use that ability. You know, we're going to, uh, I don't have my clicker. Will someone run my clicker to me? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little discombobulated, 30, 34, 3,500 miles and two grandbabies. My brain's not, not completely engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Blame your innocent children. <laughs> We've been talking about this. And, you know, I've, I've, I've struggled a little bit because this is a longer series than I had intended. But you know what? I make no apologies. We need men. We need to equip men. I'm commanded in 2 Timothy chapter 2 to find faithful men. And, and the problem is if you don't find faithful men to start with, where are you going to get them? You've got to challenge them to step up and be men. So ladies, you can apply these principles to all of you, but uh, we're going to continue. We've been talking about point men. And, and remember, point men is a military term of a leader of a small unit whose job was to go and go through enemy territory and flush out the landmines and the booby traps and spot the enemy and then find a safe way to navigate the larger company before him. And if the point man fails, not only does he fail his unit, the five or six men with him, he ultimately may fail the five or six hundred men uh, and women that are looking for that safe path to follow. So we talked about accepting our responsibility, knowing the real enemy, and getting equipped. And uh, this is a, and I solicited from the church family and would still welcome your insights. And this is a quote I got from well, one person. I, I, I intentionally didn't refresh my memory who it was. Uh, but this is a quote from one of the, I think it was one of the ladies who submitted uh, this point on I. In our society where masculinity is borderline a crime, it is critical for the point men in our lives to remember that they are important. And this comes from a lady who said, this, this is an important issue. And, and I often wonder how many, how many times we as men don't recognize how important we are to our families. She continues, their leadership and guidance with the Spirit of God driving or motivating them is needed and important. Jesus revealed Satan's goal is to first find a way to bind the strong man, the point man. And then he'll be able to spoil his house. So, man, we have to figure out how Satan is binding us, immobilizing us, keeping us from being engaged. Otherwise, it will affect our house. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about P. And these are the suggestions I got. Each one of them were biblical from the, from the people in the church. We want to point, man, if I'm going to follow someone, I want to follow someone who's prayerful. I want to follow a man who is willing to provide, to protect, to be patient, to persevere in the face of hardship to partner with me uh, and with God, to par pattern their life after Jesus, to be perceptive. We talked about, oh, these again were things that you had given me that all of them are biblical. Uh, appointment has to be observant or aware. He has to be open with the people who are following. Has to be optimistic. The word optimistic literally means courageous. Obedient to God and objective, mission-minded. And this morning, I had lots of input. I'm going to share everything I've received, but I boiled it all down into one word. Point men are inspirational. They're able to motivate, inspire the people who follow them 
to follow even in the face of danger. So how are they inspirational? Pick up reading with me in Philippians chapter 3. Paul was a point man. In Philippians, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 16, Paul was thinking about where am I going to go next? He wanted to go to Asia, but God closed that door. And then he, in a night he got a vision, and he, in the vision he saw a man from Macedonia. He says, come on over and help us. And Paul realized that was God speaking to him. So the next day he got up and started, took a ship or went to Macedonia. He went to, first place he went was a little town called Philippi. There was a lady there. And uh, she was a, a woman of, of means, and she, he shared the gospel with her. She got saved, and a little church was born. I think that lady was Lydia. And uh, she was a businesswoman, if I remember the story correctly. And then as the church grew and he would go and preach, there was a little gal that would follow him along that was possessed with the demon. And, and she would disrupt the services, and, and she was a... Uh, the people, she was a slave girl, and the people who owned her used her occultic ability to tell fortune. So Paul turned and cast the demon out in Jesus' name. Well, that got her owners upset because now she was no longer in touch with the occult. So they falsely accused Paul and Silas, and they were put in prison. So early on in the church of Philippi, Paul was sent to prison. He was beaten with, with uh, cords and, and it had hands and feet in stocks, and at midnight he praised God anyway. There was a the first jailhouse rock, you can read about it in uh, Acts chapter 16. God freed them. The jailer got saved. The church was blessed, and Paul went on. Now he's writing that young church in Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 1, guess where Paul is? Back in jail. Uh, and this time in a Roman jail. And, and so the context of the book of Philippi, the Philippians is Paul's back in jail. And Paul is trying to give them hope. You know, I remember a jail I was in when you were saved, and, and God can use these difficult circumstances for his purposes. And in chapter uh, 2, he reminds us of Christ and how we need to follow him because Jesus you know, was rich, and yet for our sakes he became poor. Pick up reading in, in verse three, fi or chapter 3. Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you for me is not grievous, uh, but for you it's safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are of the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. Paul is basically warning them there's evil out there. There's people out there that Satan is going to use. Uh, and, and verse 3, and I don't, I don't have confidence in my flesh. Though I might have confidence. And basically the next several of verses, Paul was one of those who's who. He was intelligent, he was bilingual, multilingual, he was a Roman citizen, he was, came from a wealthy family, and he, he starts talking about his pedigree. And he doesn't do it to brag, he does it to say, you know, if anyone should be confident in what they've accomplished, here's some of my accomplishments. But I came to the place in my life where I realized they were dung. Do we all know what dung is? They were dung. And then pick up reading with me in verse Seven, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is by the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable to his death if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained or either were perfect, I'm not, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth. I'm on a mission, he's saying, reaching forth unto those things which are before I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is Paul trying to do? He's trying to inspire the Philippians who were discouraged because Paul's back in prison. And Paul said, I'm on a journey. This, this prison may be the, the destination between here and eternity, or it may just be a stop. God has a purpose for me. And how can we as point men inspire? Well, the first thing that you guys gave me was be intentional. Be on a mission. Don't get sidetracked. The word intentional means deliberate, purposeful. 
Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, his appointment. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. In other words, don't forget what your job is. Don't get so distracted by the things around that you get off mission, that he may please him who hath called him to be a soldier. So in this area of being intentional, Men, I want to encourage you particularly. Do you know where you're supposed to be going? I mean, in a context of a military point, man, he has a map. He has a commanding officer. The commanding officer is, we got to find a way to get from here to here. And we don't know what's in between. So here's the map. This is what we know. You need to go find a safe route to get us and radio us when you found that route. So do you know what, your, do you know what the destination is, men? The reality, I heard many, many years ago in, in Bible college, uh, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew. And, and the application of that is a preacher, if you're not, if you're not really confident about what you're, that what you're saying is true, if you don't know where you're going, then the, whole, the people who are supposed to follow you are going to be even more confused. The principle is, in, in, whether it's a father or a boss or a, a president or a CEO or a pastor or a parent, if you don't know where you're going, what is that going to communicate to the people who are trying to follow you? Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, people perish. The people who follow get scattered. If the leader doesn't know where he's going, it's going to produce insecurity in the people who are trying to follow him. And then, first of all, men, do you know where you're, where you're supposed to be going? And then, how can you get them there safely, knowing that you're surrounded by enemy territory? And the answer to that question is, is found certainly in Scripture. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. God knows that. Proverbs chapter 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. The point is, if someone's following you, who are you following? And if you're following the God who knows what's ahead, then you can follow with confidence. Hebrews chapter 12, Paul tells us, uh, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, in that context, the people who have died before in Hebrews chapter 11, but in our context, men, are people watching us? Do we have witnesses who are watching what we do. Paul says, so knowing that we're being watched and knowing that there's a race, a, a challenge before us, let us lay aside every weight, and the word is ankos, it means things that would hinder us, and the sin, harmatia is the Greek word, it means offense or trespass, but it comes from harmatana, which means to miss the mark. The point is, it, it's related to being intentional. Where am I going? Paul says, if you're not committed to the journey and, and to the destination particularly, it's going to be easy for distractions to come along and hinder you, and it's going to be easy for sin to trip you up to cause you to miss that mark. The sin which does so easily beset us. The word beset, euparistatos, it means it competes. There are things that compete with God in our lives. There are things that compete with our families in our life. There are things that distract us from what we're really supposed to be doing. Not everything that is important is urgent. And not everything that is urgent is important. But so many times we get caught in the tyranny of the urgent and we never find our way back to what is really important. Point men are intentional. Paul got out of the prison in Philippi, a couple years later ended back up and back in the prison and he was about to have his head chopped off. The, the penalty for non-Roman citizens, death penalty, was often by crucifixion. Paul wasn't, Peter was crucified upside down, by the way, by Nero, the emperor. Paul wasn't crucified, he was beheaded. That was a courtesy done because Paul was a Roman citizen. But Paul knew, and he was writing, he's looking at the death penalty. He's on death row. He writes a letter to Timothy, and he says, I have fought a good fight. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Do you see the intentionality here, Paul? Because I've not gotten sidetracked, because I've stayed focused, because I've been intentional, henceforth, because of this, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous day, shall give me in that day. I underline that day because that day is coming for all of us. 
However we get there, it's coming for all of us. And if we've not been intentional and we've been distracted, we've got caught up in sin, we've missed the mark, we've been hindered from what we're supposed to do, how are we going to feel on that day when we're standing before the God who called us to be appoint men particularly, but these principles apply to the women here too. There's coming a day that we will give an account. Paul said, in that day, which I'm seeing coming down the road pretty quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says there's coming a day when we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive the things which we've done, whether they be good or whether they be bad. But Paul says, not to me only, but to all them that love him is appearing. All of those who stay focused on what's really important. I think I put these in the notes. There are many other passages that talk about this principle. I encourage you to spend some time reflecting on that day because that day is coming to you too. The other I that you guys gave me was not just in, uh, he's intentional, but he's involved. What does that mean to you? When it says a, a, a successful point, man, the kind of man I want to follow is involved. Do you suppose that, I don't know, I, several people gave me this, and I'm not going to tell names because I don't remember them. But suppose that means he's involved in bass fitting, fishing. He's involved in golf. He's involved in the community, is that, do you think that's really what the person who said, I, I, I think appointment needs to be involved, are any of these things wrong? No, they're not inherently wrong, but can they not be hindrances that distract us? What do you think they meant by involved? Involved with what? They actually said involved with the family and the church. That's the, 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 what they said was involved, the one that I, I got. Well, what does it mean to be involved? Well, to be involved, first of all, we have to be interested. Have you ever tried to be involved in something you really weren't interested in? My wife is very interested in HDTV. Me, not so much. Every time we go, we don't have cable. Thank you, Jesus. But anytime we're on vacation, we're, we're in a hotel or a condo that has cable. So guess what Linda somehow naturally finds? The 24-7 HD TV program. And, and so that's a vacation for Linda. Now I have my own way of vacating and, and that means when HD TV is on, my brain checks out. I am not interested in HD TV. I didn't know who the duck, d- d- uh, whoever they are, I think I watched one half of them. I'm not involved. I'm not interested in reality TV. I got enough reality in my own life. I don't want to, I, I don't know any of that stuff. I'm not interested. When my kids were young, Matthew, Matthew got them hooked on a little game called Hero Clicks. I spent a lot of money on ridiculous little figurines, and I actually sat down to try to play with them a couple of times. And as far as I could tell, they kept changing the rules with every click. So I wasn't interested. I tried to get involved, and I spent several hours pretending I cared. And I can remember telling myself, I love my kids, I love my kids, but I hate this game. (laughs) Linda likes to, uh, when we were at the the beach, there's always... uh, camper shows at the beach, all kinds of campers down on the East Coast. And Linda, I saw her light, eyes light up as we went by more. And she looked at me and said, oh, goody. <laughs> now, here's the point. Sometimes we're not interested, but the people we love are. And the reality is sometimes when you force yourself to get interested and, and enjoy it for their sakes, what sometimes happens we begin to get more interested. Isn't that what, you know, vacations are about kids. I, I, I was mumbling to somebody, someday I'm gonna take a vacation. But I have my granddaughter with me. And so I didn't do the things I wanted to do. Linda watched a lot of HDTV and I spent a lot of time playing with Christine in the sand and taking her to the pool and watching her splash all over me. But you know, I had a good time. Why did I have a good time? Because I like sand in places it's not natural to have sand. (laughs) I love the ocean. But while Mary and Lonnie were out there where the waves were, I'm right at the break holding on to Christina, trying to keep her from getting rubbed into into the sand. 
But the point is, even though I didn't do what I was interested in, I entered into her little seven-year-old world a little bit, and I got to enjoy some of the experiences because I enjoyed it through her. Interested. Bible says love in 1 Corinthians 13, 5 doesn't seek her own. It's not about me. Not always about me. Here's a picture of a father at a little child tea set entering into his little girl's world. Now, I, I don't want you to misunderstand me, but that's not natural for men. It's not natural to to do little things that little girls like to do. So why would a man do it? He's not interested in that, but what is he interested? He's not interested in his daughter. So sometimes it's not about what the man wants, it's entering into the world of the people that he loves. See, love always pursues. We love him, John says, because he first loved us. You didn't pursue God, he pursued you. And you responded to him, I hope. Love always pursues. Love always takes the initiative, not just an interest, even if you're not naturally interested, but you love somebody enough to be interested in what they're interested in. You take the initiative. John 13, 17 talks about this. There's a little father dancing with his little girl. I doubt that that father is into ba ballet, but that little girl is, so he takes the initiative and invites her to dance with him. Jesus said, if you know these things, someone finish that verse. Happy are you if you do them. You know certain things, but you don't want to do those things, so you're not, therefore, you're robbed of that happiness. And the word happy is makarios. It literally means supremely blessed. How many times do we, do we forfeit a blessing because we know things, but we don't want to do things? <laughs> We know what would please our wives or children, but we, don't want, we want to please ourselves so we don't do the things that would please others. And in doing that, we bypass that blessing that Jesus promised. And then the other I, in order to inspire, is intimacy. And this is, an, another lady wrote this definition. This is not my definition, but it works. What if she said, when she said intimate, she said deeply or closely personal, familiar. Detailed or deep knowledge of close union or a combination of the parts. I thought that was interesting. I didn't call this person and say, what did you mean? But I thought that was an interesting, a combination of the parts. And you know, that reminded me of a scripture. First Corinthians chapter 12 is, talks about the body of Christ, the church. It says, you are the body of Christ and members in particular. You're all, we're all part of, of the body of Christ. He says, and God has placed the members in the body, every one of them has pleased him, that there should be no schism or division in the body, but, but every part should have honor, to such a point that when one member suffers, every member suffers. One, mem one member is honored, every member rejoices. Have you ever stubbed your toe? Have you ever got a bad splinter? Did your body, was your body aware of that? Sure it was. Jesus in John 15, 15, upper room, last night of his earthly life, he's opening up his heart to them. It's the passage in verse 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled, believe in God and believe also in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you and until, until that place is prepared, I'm gonna prepare you for that place. And then in verse 15 he says, I'm not, I don't call you just my servants, because the servant doesn't know what his Lord is doing, but I've called you my friends, because all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known to you. What is Jesus saying? You're not just my servants, you're my friends. I'm not hiding things from you. I'm opening my heart and sharing what God has shared with me. In chapter 14, same, same conversation earlier, he looks at the disciples and says, he that hath my commandments and keeps them, Terejo guards them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. And notice this, I will manifest myself to him. What is Jesus saying? Last night, upper room, more intimate environment. He knows he's going to be betrayed. He knows they're going to forsake him. He's washing their feet. He's saying, you know, this, this is not about rule keeping. This is about relationship. And those that really love me, these issues are not going to be complicated to them. It's not really, do I have to do them? It's, do I want to do them? Going to church isn't just about, I got to go, I guess, but I want to be here. I want to understand my relationship with God better. I want to be more connected to God's people. Jesus said, those that love me, they'll understand this. 
And because they love me, there'll be a more intimate relationship. They'll understand me better. Later that night, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he turns, he separates the, the apostles, and I don't want to get sidetracked, but he takes three of them, Peter, James, and John, a little bit further. And he looks at these three, these three who had spent the most time with him, the three that were the closest to him, and he says, watch and pray. My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Would you watch with me? Do you get the vulnerability here? Jesus is about to meet Satan again. Satan meets him in the garden. Jesus knows he's about to take, God's about to take the sin of the world and place it on him. He knows that. And humanly speaking, his heart is grieved about for what he's going to do. He's going to do it, but he's asking for their prayer support because there's a spiritual battle that's about to take place very intimately. What did they do? You see him in the background there. What happened? Fell asleep. An hour later, he comes back, finds him asleep, wakes him up and says, could you not watch with one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. He goes again, he prays again, he's sweating as it were, great drops of blood, he finds them asleep again. In order to inspire, we have to be intentional, we need to be involved, We, we need to be, we need to model integrity. Proverbs chapter 20, verse Seven says the just man walks in his integrity. The word is in the Hebrew is tom. It means there's a completeness, there's a uniqueness, there's a there's an honesty about this man. What you see is what you get. You know where the word sincere comes from. Many of you know. I've said it many times, but in case you didn't, sincere is a Latin word that means without wax. And the, the, the etymology of that is when the Romans began to try to edge into the Greek artisan's work, they made pottery, but they didn't clean the clay enough, and often the pottery would crack when they put it in the furnace to harden it. And instead of throwing it away, they would just fill the cracks with wax and then paint it. So people would look at it, it looks good on the outside, so they take it home and start to use it, but when the wax melted, what happened? They saw the flaws, the cracks. So they started to stamp people who, who didn't use wax, put a stamp called sincere, a Latin for sincere. There's no wax here. What you see is what you get. And, and integrity is um, what you see is what you get. Not, not a, this is who I am, deal with it. No, I'm a work in progress. That's, isn't that what Paul said? I have not attained. I'm not perfect. I'm flawed, but I'm still moving towards the healer of all hearts. And that's what integrity is. The just man who walks in his integrity, God says his children will be blessed after him. Because a man who decides integrity is more important than, than, than friendship. Integrity is more important than, than money. Integrity is more important than anything. That's a man that will leave a safe path for his family to follow. Proverbs 11.3 uh, says, the integrity of the upright shall guide them. And, and the word upright, uh, uh, tuma, comes from tomb, same thing. Upright, integrity here is innocence or complete. Someone who's not hiding the flaws. But the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. One of my favorite verses about leadership is found in Psalm 78. It's about David. Now we know David was not a flawless man, Yes. He wasn't a flawless man, but what he was was a transparent man. He wasn't comfortable hiding his sin from God or others. He tried, like you and I try, but he says, my roaring all the day night, my tears have been my meat. I'm I'm tired of this battle inside. I'm just going to come back to God and say, God, I blew it again. Said David fed the people of Israel according to the integrity of his heart. He was able to lead because he had a heart, not a flawless heart, but an honest heart, an open heart, and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. If you, you know, the problem is we're so focused in this society on skill, we're not focused on integrity. You can teach skill, you can't really teach integrity. Integrity has to be caught, not taught. But it can only be caught when it's modeled. 
And that means when we fail, when those cracks appear, men, we don't fill them with wax. We come to those that follow us and say, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me and pray for me. Hold me accountable that I don't keep falling into this snare. Now, integrity involves our tongues. And that, that, by that, I mean what we say. Many of you know the story of Job. He was wealthy. He was honest. He was upright. God described him as perfect. Not perfect like flawless, but perfect as in full of integrity. There was a deal behind the scenes. Uh, Job did nothing about Satan and God. And God, Satan said, you're just a sugar daddy. If you, if you take away his blessings, he will curse you to your face. And God said, you're on. And one day he lost his children. He lost his wealth. Satan came back to God and, well, I'm still not wrong. He will curse you. He will curse you if you let me hurt him personally. Let me at him, not just at the people around him. And by the way, I think the first is worse than the second. If Satan wants to hurt me, he does it through my family. I would a thousand times more rather have the problems myself than to watch people I love suffer. And most of you as parents understand that. But this didn't work, so he said, well, let me add him. Maybe he's just selfish in nature. He doesn't care about the people around him. Not true. So he, he afflicted him, the Bible says, with a disease. The Jewish rabbis told, tell us it was black leprosy. I don't know what it was, but it says from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, he was covered with wounds and pulsing sores. So that the only relief he could find was to sit in the garbage pile and scrape the pus out of his wounds. Miserable condition. So what's this got to do with integrity? Well, his wife snaps. She didn't seem to snap when the children died. And he said, I came into the world naked, and, and I came, I'm going to return naked. The Lord gave me these things. We enjoyed them while we had them, but now the Lord's taken them. He's still God. But when her husband got sick, this is what she said, dost thou still retain your integrity? And then she said, why don't you just curse God and die? Did she know who was speaking through her? See, that we learn in chapter 1, that's exactly what Satan was saying was going to happen. And now Satan has found a bitter woman to try to make that happen in his wife. But notice his integrity was tied to what she was trying to get him to say. Curse God and die. Our tongues, what we say. That's why David said, Lord, set a watch before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lip. Guard my, Jesus said guard your heart because out of it are the issues of life and out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. But integrity is, involves what we say. Integrity involves what we do, our track record. Psalm 26, 1 says, judge me, O Lord, for I've walked in my integrity. It's not just what I am, it's what I do is a reflection of what I am and I've trusted in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. See, if our, if our words are saying one thing but our walk what we do is saying something else. We're sending the message that I cannot be trusted. Bob Jones, an evangelist of the early and mid-1900s, said, your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. When I grew up, I grew up in an alcoholic home, and uh, my dad was an alcoholic. He left us when I was about six. My mom became an alcoholic following the terrible advice of a country doctor who said, you know, you've been through so much, you just need a couple of beers at night to help you to relax, to calm your nerves so you can sleep. Those couple of beers turned into several beers, turned into hard liquor, and my mom would drink herself to sleep most nights. But I can remember as a child, alcohol was everywhere. I'm talking about hard liquor, tequila, bourbon, brandy, vodka. My mom liked to mix drinks. And I remember as a little boy of about 10 or 11, I'd start saying, what's the big deal? I can still remember the first taste of alcohol I had. You'll, I'll never forget. It burned all the way down. And my mom would get angry at me because I'd sip some of her drinks. And she said, don't you do that. Don't do that. What are you, crazy? Can you imagine me as an 11-year-old boy hearing that? knowing that for the last six years, I've watched my mom drink every night. And I thought, you know, I can't hear what you're saying because I'm watching what you're doing. Your walk talks, your talk talks. 
I'm not saying don't teach your kids the right thing, but integrity means following up your words with a life that, that is consistent with your words. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, 17, I know this is talking about the church, but the principle applies at home too. Remember them which have the rule over you. Why did I underline rule? Hegeomai. It means someone's there. Someone is your commanding officer. You're not alone out there, point man. You're not the general. Somebody is, you're going to answer to somebody. And may I remind you, everybody has somebody that under God has given command. We don't like to think that way as men. And you know what? We don't like to think that way as women. But I'm not here to tell you how we ought to think. I'm here to tell you what God says. There's somebody that in some area of your life has a command over you. So God says, remember them. Don't forget them. Don't neglect them. Those who, especially those who have spoken to you the word of God. What, what is the significance here? They're an authority who has an authority. They're, they're, you may have a, a captain over you, sergeant, but that captain has a colonel over him. Those who are over you who are trying to follow God, you better f- pay attention to them because it's not just about them and it's not just about you. Then it says, but follow their faith. Follow them. Those who are trying to follow God, those who God has placed in authority of, over you, follow them. But notice what it says, considering the end of their conversation. And this is an old, this is King James, an old English. The word conversation means what to us. Yeah, listen to what they're saying. And there's some truth in that, right? Because integrity is reflected by what we say, but that's not what the word means. It's anastrophe. It means watch where they're walking. It literally means pay attention to how they behave. And the point is conversation, what they say, and conduct, what they do. And if you're blessed to have leaders in your life who say and do the same thing, then follow those people. Paul, t- and finally, integrity deals with our trustworthiness. Genesis 18, 19, God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their evil. And God's having a conversation with the angels and says, Shall I withhold from Abraham the thing which I'm about to do? Seeing I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken. I want to focus on God says, I know Abraham. Here's my question, man. Does God know you? Does God know you? Does he know you with the same level of confidence that says, I, 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 he can't control what his children are going to do, but I know he's going to do his best to teach them the right way. See, the truth is we spend far too much time struggling and wrestling about whether we can trust God. Do we not? We need to spend a little time about wondering if God can trust us. Integrity involves our tongue, what we say, our track record, what we do, and our trustworthiness. Are we faithful to obey the commands of our authority? So inspiration, what does it really mean to inspire? Well, the dictionary definition means to motivate. That's no surprise. Fathers, we're supposed to motivate our children. We're supposed to motivate our wives. But you know, there's another, the second dictionary definition is to breathe. That's a little strange, isn't it? To breathe? To inspire means to breathe? Well, the word inspire comes from the Latin inspirare. In means what? In. Sperare means to breathe. So the technical definition, and the word sperare also means spirit. It's interesting, when God created Adam, what did he do? He breathed into Adam the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When Jesus described the Holy Spirit, it was the pneuma, the breath, the breath of God. This was used originally in the Latin to describe somebody being touched by a supernatural being, somebody being inspired by God with an idea or a challenge or a command. Here's my point. To inspire our children 
and our families and those who would, we would influence and lead. It's about God's spirit in us, not our own ability. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But his grace was not in vain. God, allowing God's spirit to work in you gives you, first of all, the clarity to follow him. Jesus talked about the spirit will guide you. And it gives you the confidence to lead others. We read Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, it's God that works in you both to will and to do his good work. Philippians chapter 3, we read, let's, let's wrap up with the last few words Paul described. Paul says, I forget the things which are behind. I reach forth of the things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm following someone. And the someone I'm following is the Spirit of God leading me towards a life that's going to be honoring to God. Then he says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, and again, the word is not flawless, it's teleos, complete, those who are working towards the end. Let's be thus minded. Let's think like that. Then he goes on to say with confidence, be followers together of me. Paul says, I've already told you who I'm following. I've inspired you to realize I modified my life and my priorities so that I can follow Christ. Now I'm looking to you and say, follow me to the degree that I'm following Christ. Be followers together of me. But then he warns, mark them which walk, so as you have us for an example, right? Paul says, you've seen how I've walked, you've, seen, you've heard my words, you've seen my life, but watch out because there's other people going to try to get you to follow them. So follow me and mark those which walk as you have us for an example. Follow, the, follow others who are following Christ. Because many walk. He's writing to the church, many walk, of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Paul says, if you follow the wrong people, they'll lead you to the wrong places. Because their focus, their destination is earthly things. They're not, they're not taking you, preparing you for eternal things. For our conversation, political, our lifestyle, our lifestyle, rather, uh, is in heaven. What we're doing, how we're walking, where we're going, it's about heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's my application to reflect on, to the point, man. We've been talking about inspiring. There are times on the journey, even as Paul wrote in the Philippians, he's in jail, Things didn't work out the way he thought they were going to work out. The people who loved him and were following him were discouraged. How in the world you are doing all these good things, Paul? And it always seems you don't stay at the Hilton when you go to a new place. You end up in the jail. What's God doing? And Paul is writing to try to inspire them. I don't know exactly what God is doing through this season of my life, but I know who I'm following. And if God led me here, he led me here for a reason. And then, by the way, isn't it interesting? Remember when I ended up in prison back in your hometown, how that worked out? How because of that experience you got saved? Maybe God has people. There's a reason I'm here. But Paul is writing to inspire them. Man, I want to ask you, because he, he kind of, chapter 3, he says, so follow me because I'm following him. Can you look back at your wife's wife, your children? the people that you may lead in, in other areas, influence, can you look back and say the same thing? Do you have the confidence to look at them and say, follow me, Amen. follow me, because I'm doing my best to follow Christ. Paul says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Men, what are you pressing for? What are you pressing for? Because most of the things that we press for, God describes as wood, hay, and stubble. It's all going to be gone. If all you leave your children and your wife is money and property, that'll be gone too. What are you pressing towards? Paul says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And by doing that, he inspired the church of Philippi. And 2,000 years later, I hope us to press towards that same mark. Let's pray.